So um, my name is Tara Chelner and I'm the ecologist um, with the department. And I think I've met most of you before with the training that um, the, the initial webinar we gave for a few weeks back. And this is going to be um, so something completely different from what we've heard already this morning. Um, I'm going to be giving two talks this morning. So this first one is just a short one on the value of, of Irish grasslands, some of the other values to grasslands that we mightn't um, think of that regularly. And then after that, I'll be talking about um, uh, going into the grassland scorecard in, in some detail. But we'll have a break in between those two sessions anyway. So um, to give you an idea then of the value of uh, Irish grasslands, as agricultural advisors, I mean, you, you all know what, um, what's of most value for livestock and for forage production and silage production and how best to manage grasslands for productivity. Um, but because grassland is, is, um, is all around us, it's ubiquitous in Ireland, and um, I think there's, it's a, there's a natural human tendency amongst everybody to, to not recognise things as being special or um, important when they're commonplace and we see them every day. And I recognise that as a farm advisor, I suppose, uh, working a few years back in North Yorkshire, where I was working with farmers who all had nesting curlew and nesting lapwing in their fields. And I mean, they were born, the farmers were born in these, these farms and that that's, this is what they'd grown up with. And they didn't know that, that these were endangered species or that um, they weren't found on, on other people's farms and they were just so accustomed to, to seeing them that they didn't, they didn't recognise, of course they loved them, but they didn't know um, just how important that they were. So I think that um, the, the same probably applies to, to, to grassland in Ireland, our semi-improved and our semi-natural grasslands, which are a really valuable resource um, for biodiversity and water and uh, carbon sequestration and lots of other services besides our food and forage values. And we're just kind of more familiar with those food and uh, uh, forage values. So all of these um, other values are sort of hidden in plain sight. So I just wanted to give you a flavour maybe of, um, you're, you're familiar with this already, but it's worth, it's worth thinking about it a little bit more, I think, and to, to think a little bit more about their value. So if we start with different grassland types in the world, well, elsewhere in the world, you've got natural grasslands and uh, natural grasslands are not altered by man. So what we mean by those is like the really big, the massive uh, prairies across North America or the savannas in Africa. And these are natural climax vegetation types and they're, they're, they're naturally grassland. They don't have to be altered, managed for, they're not managed um, by, by, by man in any way. And they're kept as grasslands either through the climatic factors that are um, uh, operating there or through grazing by large herbivores. But we don't have any natural grasslands in Ireland. All of the grasslands in Ireland are altered by man for agriculture. So what we have are semi-natural grasslands, semi-improved and improved grasslands. And all of our grasslands have been subject to some degree of agricultural improvement by repeated grazing, mowing, fertilizer or herbicide treatments. But these grasslands, they form a continuum. So it's not possible to really define or put, put one into one of these categories with precision. But we, we all recognize the extremes and this is what I'll be talking a little bit about. Why is there so much grassland in Ireland if it's, if it's not our natural vegetation type of, you know, we were all familiar with that like 5,000 years ago, that the landscape here would have been dominated by woodland and, um, but it's because of farmers, farmers managing most of our land and all of Ireland's or much of Ireland's uh, rich biodiversity has evolved from agricultural land management. And our farmers are incredibly important custodians of biodiversity. So if we look at either end of the spectrum, then if you like, so if we look at the improved grassland and associated with intensive farming. So improved grassland, the management of it will involve some or all of the following. It will be uh, ploughed, drained, reseeded, which um, it'll, it needs to have those things to accommodate the high stocking rates. There'll be use of chemicals for, through um, uh, herbicide or fungicide or pesticide use. And there'll often be field boundary removal 
um, hedgerows or stonewall removal, and that's to facilitate um, large machinery and ease of access for these fields. There'll be lime applied and chemical uh, fertilizer regularly applied and, and slurry. And you know that's um, that this is absolutely what is needed is such um, you know we're talking about dairy farming such tight margins. This is the way that land must must be managed um, to produce um, those services. On the other end of the scale, then we've got semi-natural grassland associated with extensive farming. So I think that um, you can all probably recognise that in the photo here that I mean that the, it's obvious that there's not going to be many of the the uh, features, the management um, that was associated with the improved grassland associated with this. Now, we're not in REAP that we're not advocating that people have are aiming for a grassland that's that's this good. I mean, this is the best of the best. So in any uh, in any of the results-based programs that have gone before us or that are ongoing now, like uh, the Burren program or the RBAP since Ligo and Leitrim or the Hen Harrier project or the Pearl Muscle project and REAP, a grassland that looks like this is going to score 10 out of 10. Okay, it's the best out of the best. But like I showed you before, the um, intensive grassland is one end of the spectrum. This is the opposite end of the spectrum. So it just helps to, to make a point. And of course, there's various uh, stages. Um, it, they exist, uh, grasslands exist on a continuum between the two. So this one, no ploughing, receding, little or no fertilisation, and the only chemical use is probably the, if there was any weed wiping of rushes, for example, and field boundaries are likely to be retained, may or may not have been drained. But what, you know, do, does this really matter, like if a grassland is intensively managed or if it's extensively managed, does it really matter for um, nature and biodiversity? Is, you know, is, is there any impacts or, um, you know, surely that, I mean, if, the, if there's external boundaries, there's still um, water courses and there's still places for nature to exist. Well, it's, it's, it actually does have a big impact on, on our nature and our biodiversity. And so a typical improved field um, used for silage, for example, is dominated by one or a few species, like um, usually perennial ryegrass. There's not many other species that are going to be associated in perennial ryegrass field. Okay, it's, uh, and there's not many other species that can cope with such high nutrient conditions and high competition scenarios. So the, the other species that would exist would be things that, that, that favor nutrient enrichment, nettles and docks and thistles, um, um, etc. Some white clover, and production will be high in these fields, um, but other services such as biodiversity will be lower. So there is obviously a, a trade-off um, that exists um, all the time. The trade-off with every, everything in life. So um, if, you, if you're aiming for a really high production, that this is how you manage a field, but you know it's not compatible with having high levels of biodiversity. And then on the, on the other hand, semi-natural grasslands have a much higher diversity of species and uh, structure um, with uh, different heights and rooting depths and soil diversity. And there'd be a huge amount of complex uh, food webs um, ongoing in the soil between microorganisms and bacteria and fungal associations and so much that scientists don't even know about yet. Uh, but a, a huge amount of diversity ongoing, and you could have over 40 species in a two by two meter square in these uh, grasslands. And if you compare that like in 40 species in two by two meter square, and you might have like, you know, only a handful of species in a whole field, a five hectare field um, of, the, of the improved field. And one of the um, other benefits, of, other than biodiversity then, that there's some other benefits associated with the semi-natural grasslands. Well, there's animal health benefits um, and anti-hemanthic benefits, but as well as that, there are some benefits to the, the grassland and the grassland persistence itself. There's a much higher resilience um, because, well, I suppose because there's lots of different species there, so that like with climate change, if there's really wet conditions or really dry conditions, that it won't suit every species. But if, if, if it doesn't suit some species, well, then um, there's plenty of other species to, that, that, uh, that can cope and overall, this, the, the system is healthy enough that it can it can um, persist. So I'm not going to go into th this slide in very much detail, um, but it's just highlighted some of the, the main ecosystem services provided by grassland. So things like uh, crop pollination, um, carbon sequestration, um, 
um, diversity of plants and animal species, water, flood protection, genetic resources, etc. But then if you look at, at the top one, it's um, livestock forage and food production. So it's, there is a trade-off between these. Obviously, if you're going to be managing with um, productivity in, in mind, and if that is your main goal, um, well, then some of these other services won't be as provided for. So there's a, a huge amount of, um, of uh, diversity associated with, um, with species-rich grassland and semi-natural grassland. So uh, species-rich grassland is always semi-natural, I should say. And not all semi-natural grassland is species rich, though a lot of it is. So if we were to talk about like the food web of, um, of, of grassland as a whole, I mean, you could write a whole book on that. There's like there's just intricate and thousands and thousands of different um, food webs and different relationships going on. But I've just picked a couple of points here, just um, a couple of points on plants and um, one on plants, one on soils. And um, just to show you that the value that's in our grasslands, or to highlight the value that's in our grasslands. And this photo is of common knapweed. Now, common knapweed is one of our indicator species in the grassland scorecard. And um, I think, you know, that a lot of you will be familiar with it already. I'm not sure what other colloquial names there is on it, things like bachelor's buttons, I've heard. Um, but it's incredibly important for biodiversity and it may support um, well over 50 species as well as 20 species of micro fungi. And that's just associated with that one plant. And to give you an idea then of the diversity in traditionally managed pasture, um, I'm not going to read all these numbers because I'll just trip over myself. But um, for example, with mites, there's 666 million uh, mites and um, millions of springtails, aphids, um, beetles, and various other arthropods. And what that all adds up to is, is a well over a billion arthropods, up to 50 per cubic inch in these grasslands. Well, are these grasslands threatened? And yes, they very, very much are. And, and uh, so we need to, to look after them. This was the main threats, conversion to uh, forestry or intensive agriculture or quarrying um, and being lost through reseeding. Also abandonment, abandonment applies to huge, huge areas in, in, in Ireland, which, is, uh, which is, is very bad for these habitats too. So, so the message is that these grasslands need management. So it's not that you just like, I think that some farmers are frightened and thinking that, oh, well, if this field is, for example, you know, if it's really, if, if it, it could be designated, it could be a natura site, for example, or just leave it alone because they're frightened of uh, thinking that management might, might um, not be what we're looking for. Whereas th that's, that's not true at all. It's traditional uh, types of management that, that's, that's needed and uh, management that's appropriate for what the aims are for that grassland. Sorry. So I don't know if you're aware of this and you probably um, don't realize the significance of it, um, but apart from reseeding, the most damaging activity to, to, to grasslands and to the species within those grasslands, whether it's one of those incredibly species-rich grasslands or whether it's a semi-improved grassland, but the most damaging activity to any of the, the botanical species within a grassland is nutrient application. So a grassland is valuable and the reason that we're paying for it and rewarding it in REAP is because of the number of, and diversity of plant species in it and the animals they support and the combined services that they provide to soil, vegetation, water and the climate. But adding nutrients drastically alters the species competition so it gives a huge competitive advantage to a handful of grasses and other, and other species and squeezes out most other plants. So should all land be managed for maximum productivity or should all land be managed for optimum productivity? The effects of um, applying fertilizer on grasslands have been really well studied um, internationally and across the EU and nationally here as well. And th this um, effects of uh, phosphorus on diversity was demonstrated in, in the Burren uh, through a study quite recently. 
and it shows that the effects are, are very, very strong with really big decreases in species numbers in just three years, big changes in abundance of species with just a small number of grasses and legumes favoured. So, you know, somebody might think, well, well, I haven't put out much. I've only just put out like, I don't know, like a, a couple of bags of 10, 10, 20, or I've just put um, put on a slurry application. But it's, uh, you know, that th these species are so sensitive that, uh, that, that nutrient applications are not really conducive to maintaining species rich grassland. And we know the current advice is uh, to, to aim to have um, optimum soil phosphorus and potassium levels in all fields and mineral soils. And we're being, um, we know that uh, we've been told that 90% of our soil sampled are at suboptimal level in, in either of these nutrients or in soil pH. And of course, this advice is applicable and is very relevant if production is our main aim. But there is a huge loss to asking for this level of fertility if your main aim isn't, isn't production, if your main aim is biodiversity, water protection, carbon sequestration, etc. And is a major risk of loss to your environmental payments through results-based programs as well if you're aiming for this productivity on all fields even if the fields are not are not suited for it so the objective should be to uh you know where you where you have your productive land by all means that you follow the advice for production but where you have land that's of more value for nature that perhaps that you should do some cost benefit analysis on your farm and and uh, manage it as best for nature as you can so this is just um, an example in, um, I'm not sure what county it is now, I've forgotten, I think it was Sligo, but it was in, in Annex 1, so Annex 1 was is, um, uh, is, is in the Natura uh, grassland, um, a lowland hay meadow, and it was surveyed in 2009 is the first photo, the photos aren't very clear, and the next uh, photo is the same grassland in 2016. So in 2009, you can see that it's quite species rich and you can see different uh, flowers um, throughout the sward. And um, it's had slurry applied in the intervening years. I don't know if it was every year or I don't know how often the slurry was applied. But you can see in 2016, um, all I can see that's left is uh, Yorkshire fog and some ducks. Um, I can't see anything else in there. So it, it's lost um, all, of it, all of its value. And if that had been getting paid in week, well, th th there's th there's nothing to pay for in in this in the second photo. Um, briefly, um, just to, to, to talk about th this is um, like if you had if you had a woodland say across the road from your house and it was it, it was there for a hundred years and it was clear felled in the morning, will it be a dramatic impact on your view on your landscape? On, and it'll probably be a big source of conversation within your house for the next, certainly for the next couple of days. And you know that it's going to take 100 years for that to recover. If it was replanted again tomorrow, it's still going to take 100 years for it to look the way that it did a couple of days ago. And what people don't realise is that if you do the same with grassland, so if you um, do what was done to the previous grassland with slurry applications or nutrient applications, and um, you've lost all of the species diversity in it, they're not coming back. I mean, they will come back slowly, gradually, over time. But if you had, for example, a very, very species-rich grassland, like what I showed at the, at the beginning of this presentation, and you um, effectively destroyed that or put on some um, repeated uh, applications of, of fertilizer, it's going to take 100 years for that, for that to come back. And, you know, people would be devastated if, if they saw this happening to a woodland but they don't notice it happening um, when it's ha happening to our grasslands at the same time. So what are the knock-on impacts then from, um, to this to species? This is from the, uh, red, uh, the, the red list uh, vascular plants for Ireland, and uh, you can see that there's 15 plants have gone extinct in recent times. And that's bad enough, but then if you look at the figures that are highlighted below that, um, and they're all um, endangered to some extent or threatened species. There's 17% of our native plant species are, are threatened uh, with extinction. And that's almost one in five plants. And um, so it's, 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 it's not a good uh, situation for Ireland. 
of course, it's not just plants. We know that there is um, knock-on um, impacts on other species too. We're all familiar with the plight of the, um, the corn crake. Um, in the 1970s, there was like 4,000 calling males in Ireland. Now there's, that's reduced to just a handful. Um, some species have come extinct. The corn bunting went extinct in the 1990s. Uh, Twite uh, population decline of 98%. Uh, we know about uh, curlew and lapwing, everybody down at least 90%. Yellowhammer um, uh, range contraction of 60% and wind chat 77%. They're just some, um, some species that were pulled out. And we're seeing the effects on these species because of the choices that we make with land management. And these species are all associated with farmland. They're farmland birds. So just bear with me on, on, on this uh, slide now for a minute. It's very crude. It's very simplistic. And but I just wanted to to try to highlight um, again some of the values and maybe the impacts to environmental payments from managing land um, that it would be better off, you know, be managed for its nature value than for its production value. So I've looked at um, so there's three different field types here. There's very productive field. And then there's average land that's uh, really well looked after a good farmer with really good livestock and not overstocked in the middle. And on the end, you've got some a very poor agricultural field. And then I've looked at the cost per hectare, but I haven't. I've just looked at the fertilizer and reseed cost per hectare. There's a lot of other costs that haven't factored in at all. It's meal, um, vet bills, diesel, labor, machinery. Um, it goes on and on and on, I know. But so if we look at the fertilizer costs in the very productive land, um, this is for, uh, it's for cattle and sheep production, actually. You know, we're not talking about like um, dairy in here. So the, the costs of um, recommended to spend per year on fertilizer are um, for these grasslands are 172 euro per hectare. And if you say on average land, well, if the farmer decided to spend maybe just less than half of that, would be 80 euro per hectare. And then the cost of reseed and very, very productive land, you're reseeding every seven years. So divided that by seven is 50 euros. So then the cost then for fertilizer and reseed cost per hectare, 222 euro for the very productive land and 80 for the average land and nothing, of course, for the very poor land. The income per hectare then is, is the same for basic payment and ANC across them all. And I've left out uh, greening payment. And then, um, this uh, the, the cattle and sheep production uh, payment is, is crude here as well. I've said well, it's 400 euro per hectare for the very productive land. I've halved that for the average land um, and uh, with beef prices uh, good at the moment and um, a quarter did for the very poor agricultural land. But um, the environmental payments then that are associated or that can be got through REAP and going forward, um, this is the future of farming in Ireland, the environmental payments associated with, with, with these land types, obviously there's no environmental payment with the very productive land, there's nothing there to pay for, you know, this is what the results based scheme, uh, you see what you do what you've been paid for is what you can see and it's been scored on the scorecard. If there's nothing there to score on the scorecard, there's no payment. So for the if it's a score of five out of ten on the scorecard, it'd be 275 euro per hectare. And the very poor agricultural land might get, might get a score of nine out of ten, which is 375 euro per hectare. So then the final in the yellow then um, is the income minus the fertilizer reseed costs. In the very productive land, um, 478 euro per hectare. And then it goes up um, to in the middle land, which is less uh, fertilizer um, spend on it. And with the agri-environment payment, 723 euro per hectare. And the very poor agricultural land um, uh, receives the most money per hectare, 753. So what we don't want is for this farmer with this really poor agricultural land to be trying to think and thinking to himself, oh gosh, I better spend 2,000 now and trying to drain this field to try to get up to um, what's in the next column or even the very productive land. And we should be encouraging these people, um, these farmers to, to manage their land appropriately and um, to receive the, the, the most income that they can for their land and to value their land for the, their other um, services that the land provides besides food and forage, very important services too. So just a couple of slides, I'm not going into any detail on this. Um, this is probably something that we can talk about again and uh, we'll probably provide some training on this at a later date. 
Um, management for biodiversity and all grassland requires management. Uh, it's not to be let to grow wild, but the four main um, points here for biodiversity, I suppose, the things to, to note are it's to maintain or restore low nutrient status, management of scrub, ma maintenance of structural variation through grazing and increasing organic matter um, through the addition um, of dung is very important and uh, very important for soil wildlife. The appropriate maximum nutrient additions to not lose species richness. This doesn't just apply to a species rich field. This applies to losing species richness in any field. If you're aiming to try to increase the species or look after the species that, that you've got in that field to maximize your environmental payments, this is the amount of uh, fertilizers that has been shown through scientific evidence to, to not um, have negative impacts on, on the biodiversity value. So it's a maximum of 12 tonnes per hectare uh, per year, or um, or this is mean as well as it's or um, the equivalent nine uh, kilos per hectare of nitrogen, 23 of phosphate and 83 of potash. If your current level of fertilizer manure is less than this, don't increase it. Um, grazing, rotational and mixed grazing is the best way to manage grassland for diverse flora and fauna. It's better for livestock and soil health too. There's very little seed set by continuous grazing. So uh, we should be encouraging farmers uh, to, to, to fence off um, fields and paddocks where appropriate. This, uh, the last slide then. So the main message is that I hope I haven't been saying that you know that the farming is bad. It's 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 what I wanted to, to, to show was that there's there's separate uh, there's separate values for separate fields. So that everybody, every farmer, I suppose should be thinking about fitting nature into their farms as well as production. So uh, some fields, by all means, you, you know, the best, their best use is to manage them, uh, to produce as much as you can from them, food and forage. But on the others where it's, you're just throwing good money after bad and on those, and often, like I think that some farmers to be even spending money on fertilizer to try to combat rushes, and they're thinking, well, if I apply some more fertilizer here, it'll stop the rushes growing, and it doesn't. You know, I mean, I know that um, adjusting your soil pH can can um, help with rushes a bit, but it's as farm advisors, I suppose, it's important for um, for you uh, to 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 be given the appropriate messages for the appropriate land types and recognizing that there are different values of, um, um, of fields. But this is the future of farming. You know, land is now being valued for a range of services, biodiversity, carbon storage, water, water um, pollination habitat, etc. And these are the services that are valued and been paid on under we. So um, what I'd like to say to you is just to continue to, to learn. We all need, and um, myself included, to continue to, to learn and be informed about, um, about this and to help make better decision making when it comes to farming and land management. Thanks Tara and we, we just have two poll questions related to this particular presentation just to see how well people are listening so if we can put up the poll questions now. The first question is, is relates to reseeding you know after reseeding what is the most damaging activity to species rich grassland so you select one of the options is it nutrient enrichment to fertilization, high stock and density, or abandonment, or herbicide use. So just select one of the options. Just to clarify as well, one of the points uh, coming up in, in the questions that in relation to splitting of parcels, the TLAMS system itself is independent of the BPS. So any fields created there or parcels split doesn't impact on the BPS. So because it's a short term project, any changes in REAP are for REAP purposes only on the DLAM system. So you're not making any permanent changes to the parcels in the BPS system, just to make that clear. So there are, there are some other technical questions. Again, they relate to the, the following presentation, which, which Tara is going to do on the after the break on the low input grassland scorecard. And a lot of these issues will be clarified there. So if, if we can bring up the second poll question then, relate question number three, it's again, Tara has just been speaking about this. Just looking at the, the results of the first, the first poll, uh, it's 77% for nutrient, nutrient fertilization, high stock and density coming out of five, 
abandonment obviously an issue but a lower issue in herbicide use also a threat so we'll bring up the second uh, somewhat related question now so what what is the if you can bring up that question it's to do again with the amount of nutrient allowed before species richness is lost So what is the maximum total kgs of nitrogen per hectare that is allowed before species richness is reduced? So is it nine kgs per hectare, 18 or 40? So it just was covered in one of the last slides, which, which, which Tara covered. Just to clarify as well, if someone was asking about the identification key book, and that will be posted out to all the accredited REAP advisors. So we'll, we will have be posting those out towards the end of next week to the people who successfully attended this training event. Um, so just make sure you, you stay tuned in full to both sessions, uh, both A and B tomorrow, or you have the option of registering for next week if you can't make tomorrow's session, that's session B. So I think if we could close that poll now, and we'll, we'll, we'll just see. Um, the results of that one so obviously 70 percent uh, going for nine kgs or hectare and that that is the correct answer so once you go above nine kgs as as tara mentioned or 12 tons of organic manure um then you're you're really threatening the the species you're, you're likely to reduce the species richness in subsequent years so thanks very much for your attention so far